Okay, uh, hello and welcome back. I would now like to introduce uh, Professor Yet Ming Chan, who is Kyocera Professor in the MIT uh, Department of Materials, Science and Engineering. He is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering and his research at MIT focuses on the design, synthesis and characterization of advanced inorganic materials and related devices. He is also a serial entrepreneur and he will now be talking about leveraging the low cost renewable electricity megatrend. Very excited to hear about this. Over to you, Yetming. Thank you, Harveen. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, uh, I would uh, like to now uh, continue on from those uh, uh, high level remarks that Richard make, uh, made and talk about some specific uh, techno technological directions. And as you see from the title, uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about is how best to use the uh, declining cost of renewable electricity uh, in the service of climate change. And so uh, I have roughly three topics I want to, to tell you about today. I know we only advertised two, but there's a short one at the end. So uh, let me uh, jump into it and say that the, uh, with the declining cost of electricity, we can store it. And I'll say a little bit about uh, storing it. Uh, and you'll hear more from a polyjewel later on in, uh, in the session about technologies to store electricity. Or we can use that electricity uh, for another purpose. And I want to talk about how we might use that electricity for uh, reinventing the cement uh, production process. And so on the first topic, uh, I think you know, many of you know uh, that you know, coal is on its way out. And the plot on the left here is from uh, the uh, US uh, Energy Information Administration. And what you see is that uh, coal is declining, uh, nuclear is flat, uh, hydro is relatively flat, but what's increasing is natural gas, right? at least in North America. What's also increasing is renewable electricity, but renewable electricity is a factor of five lower. Right? If this trend continues, you know, uh, natural gas becomes the natural winner. Right? And so this is one way of uh, putting in perspective uh, what needs to happen if we're to have renewables increase and overcome uh, natural gas and other fossil fuels here. And that uh, something that we need is uh, storage. Uh, the right-hand plot uh, shows you the declining cost in you know, uh, many parts of, uh, of the US today, you can get electricity for less than uh, two cents a kilowatt hour. Right? So uh, as we think about this problem, uh, one of the uh, issues we started to realize is that if you want to store electricity from renewable generation and make it fully dispatchable, you need to deliver electricity uh, on timescales that cover uh, from less than an hour to ultimately it could be an entire season. Right? So uh, let's say uh, two or three orders of magnitude and time scale. Uh, uh, but one thing that we've re realized recently through some uh, data analytics studies is that uh, multi-day storage moving beyond a, uh, an hourly, uh, sorry, a, a daily cycle of the diurnal cycle to multi-day storage is something that we're going to need. And on the left here is a plot which shows 20 years of backwards looking data about Iowa wind plus solar and what it would take to take that renewable generation pattern in Iowa, you know, in the wind belt in the United States and turning that into dispatchable electricity. And each of those spikes downwards is uh, a, a, a few days. Right? And so uh, let's uh, take a somewhat of an average of that and say that we need about 100 hours of storage to take that kind of renewable electricity and make it dispatchable. To beat natural gas, which today is uh, about $1,000 a kilowatt uh, is the electricity that we produce from natural gas. If we were to store it over 100 hours, the simple arithmetic tells us, uh, arithmetic tells us that the capital cost of the storage technology needs to be on the order of $10 a kilowatt hour. And there we run into the, uh, the immediate problem that lithium ion today is about $250 a kilowatt hour. In fact, just the chemicals, uh, the storage chemicals that go into making a lithium ion battery uh, cost about $25 a kilowatt hour. And so it's one of these uh, uh, issues that you can't get there from here. If just the materials cost more than the ultimate system has to cost you. Okay? The second question we might face is that uh, there has to be a supply of whatever we use. And so how much storage will we need and what kind of materials do we need to look to? Right? So 
I, I want to unpack this number, but the uh, MIT Energy Initiative, we've been looking into this over the last year, uh, uh, plus some. And uh, a, a nice round number uh, for the amount of grid storage we might need is 100 terawatt hours worldwide. And so what does that mean? You know, we don't all think in terms of terawatt hours. To put that in perspective, in the year 2050, that is a battery the size of a, of a Tesla Model S automotive battery for every 10 citizens on the planet, right? So think of, you know, one and a half households uh, somewhere, and for every uh, 10 people, you need a, a battery of that size. Doesn't sound crazy, right? So, uh, you know, it, it it's, uh, doesn't seem out of reach. We can ramp all the manufacturing and other things that need to happen. But the, the key here is getting to that 100 terawatt hours at this very low cost of $10 a kilowatt hour. What we've realized that uh, is that in order to make this happen, we need to look at uh, look to materials that are tremendously earth abundant. Uh, things like sulfur, like zinc, like iron. Uh, it can't be cobalt, can't be nickel. Uh, preferably, it does is is not uh, lithium based. Right? And so, uh, what kind of uh, technologies might that look like? Well, so uh, without speaking about specific technologies, I want to point to this area of very low cost inorganics. Right, which sulfur, zinc, iron constitute. And uh, ask you to imagine a, a battery plant that might look like something like this to scale. And this is a battery plant that on a footprint basis has about the same power delivery as a natural gas power plant today. Uh, that's one to two megawatts per acre, right, would be the, the actual number here. And so um, uh, the work that uh, we spun out a company from MIT about three years ago, and uh, uh, here are my colleagues. Uh, uh, you know, here's a founding team of, uh, of five. And the company is called Form Energy. And we're trying to commercialize this kind of technology. And uh, the most recent announcement is that there is now a contract to build a pilot plant uh, in the year 2023 uh, with a, a utility called Great River Energy in the upper Midwest, uh, which is uh, phasing in more and more wind and, uh, and some solar. but uh, mostly when, and at the same time, is shutting down uh, the largest uh, coal-fired power plant in their portfolio 10 years ahead of schedule. Right? So this is a, a, a um, indication of, uh, of uh, uh, things that are right now happening in the world of you know, large-scale energy storage. Okay, um, top. That was the that was the first uh, example. This next one uh, relates to a broader topic of how to use electrochemistry for materials processing. But it's going, to go, it's going to focus on cement, right? And uh, the reason for that is the following. Uh, cement today uh, is 8% of global emissions per year. Uh, a simple number to remember is that each kilogram of cement we produce generates a kilogram of CO2, right? Uh, the third number here is what makes this such a difficult problem. Uh, when you have a commodity, it's been commoditized over the last 150 years, 13 cents a kilogram, far less than bottled water. Uh, these are often the, the, the most difficult uh, areas in which to innovate. Right? And so uh, our, the question we asked is that whether or not there's a way that we can use renewable electricity uh, in order to uh, accomplish a, a, a this task. And so, uh, Here's what we would expect to happen if the rate at which we build buildings uh, on the planet continues over, let's say, until uh, the next uh, few decades, till 2060, the amount of cement we produce is actually equivalent to one new New York City every 30 days, right? And that's the volume of cement that the world produces. And uh, what happens if we uh, continue for the next 40 years? Right? And so, um, what we've started to look at is uh, where in the uh, cement production cycle uh, we really need to uh, reinvent uh, the process. And so I need to tell you a little bit about how cement is made today. Where the CO2 comes from is one half from a chemical source. That's limestone. So calcium carbonate is limestone. Crushed limestone goes into a cement plant. It's at, uh, added to it are other oxides and silicates. Uh, and uh, so the decomposition of the limestone is where half of it comes from and the rest comes from the fuel that we use in order to fire the power plant. Right? And so uh, we look at this and ask, uh, is there a way to take that calcium carbonate and decompose it 
And instead of letting the CO2 go out in the flue gas stream, right, where it's part of a dirty mix with, uh, for instance, uh, NOx, uh, sulfur dioxide, and things like that, it's dilute. It's, it's very hard to capture at that point. Can we intercept the cycle much earlier on? And can we do it using electrochemistry? Right? And so the inspiration for the process that we develop uh, is shown here. And uh, this, uh, let me see if I can get this to, there we go, okay. This uh, GIF is showing you something that all of you uh, encountered in uh, probably grade school, middle school, high school, uh, which is a, an electrolyzer, right? And the horizontal scale in color on the right is high pH and the left is low pH. So uh, we all know about the hydrogen and the oxygen that comes out. The part you forget about is the fact that an electrolyzer also produces an acid and a base. Okay. And so in this case, on the left, we have the acid being produced and the right, the base. The question that we asked is, can we use the ability of an electrolyzer to produce acids and bases and use those as reagents for chemical processing, specifically cement? And so what that led to was a, um, a scheme, which we've demonstrated uh, at lab scale and now uh, spun out as a, a, a startup company, to take the calcium carbonate that we would normally fire in a high temperature furnace and to dissolve it in that acid, release clean, cold, pure CO2 and capture that, much, much easier to do that. And then use that calcium and at the base, uh, the alkaline side, produce calcium hydroxide and use that as the feedstock into the cement kiln. So this is how the process works. Just to give you an example, on the left here is you know, natural limestone, it's rather impure. And out of our process comes this you know, uh, high purity, hydrated lime on the other side. Right? So uh, the, the chemical scheme looks like this, but the system level scheme looks something like this. And this is, uh, this is of course, our, our, our vision for one might, what one might do with a renewable uh, electricity. Uh, this uh, process, if we bring it to commercialization, would produce uh, you know, clean cement and a, a CO2 in a form that we can capture and use for other purposes, but also hydrogen. Right? And so there are a lot of things we can do with hydrogen, some oxygen, some CO2, and you see them listed here. Right? And so uh, it ranges all the way from simply uh, sequestering it to using it for agriculture, to using it for synthetic fuels. And so that is uh, what we're trying to do in, uh, in the case of uh, um, uh, uh, electrifying the, the cement industry. All right, I think I have one couple of minutes left here. <laughs> Time for one last topic. Uh, this is something that's very new and I bring it up because we just uh, received some government funding to work on this particular topic. Uh, you know, we want to continue moving downstream, you know, uh, high value batteries, 13 cents a kilogram cement, and ultimately to trash, right? And so I wanna talk about trash tech, right? New technology and trash. It turns out that uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in um, most parts of the world, uh, municipal solid waste, garbage, is collected and is burned. And we do two things uh, by burning it. First, we reduce its volume by 90%, so we have this fine ash that we can then landfill, but we still have to pay to landfill that ash. It costs you more to landfill that ash than it costs to buy fresh cement, right? Uh, the second thing uh, is that, you know, unlike, for instance, the fly ash out of a coal-fired power plant, there's actually a lot of mineral value in that uh, ash that comes out of a municipal incinerator. You know, it's burning trash as a fuel to generate electricity, right? But uh, the uh, elements that go in the ash, well, uh, you know, why is there value there? It's because we throw everything in the trash. We throw our cell phones in the trash, we throw money in the trash, jewelry goes in the trash, TVs, right? uh, everything. And so what we did was an analysis of th that you see in the plot here. The top plot is an abundance plot on a log scale of how much of each element there is. The horizontal axis is basically the periodic table. Right? And then we turn that plot by scaling each one of those elements by its uh, market value today, and we get a cost plot. And so the lower plot shows you the value of that ash by element, and what you see is that it tends to plateau after you've gotten the first 10 elements or so out of it, right? But the value of that ash uh, ranges from uh, 50 cents or so, uh, maybe 30 cents uh, at the lowest point here uh, per kilogram up to 250, 275 a kilogram. And in a separate conversation, we can talk about why the Italian ash is so valuable. Right? Okay, so what this tells us is that uh, you know, there's an opportunity here. 
Uh, and uh, this is a way to make the incinerator industry more viable because that electricity they're selling is not as valuable today as it used to be. Right? And at the same time, uh, really, you know, mine the uh, 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 the material that we would otherwise throw away. So uh, this is a, a new project, and we're again looking to low cost renewable electricity or the electricity out of a power plant itself and electrochemistry to carry out this process. So with that, I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your attention. I hope these three short vignettes give you an idea of uh, how we're trying to uh, uh, tackle some of these uh, large problems uh, in uh, in uh, addressing climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yetming. It's really, really fascinating to hear about everything from uh, trash tech, which I'm sure will become a hashtag trash tech if it hasn't already, and uh, electrifying uh, cement as well as electrical storage, a really fascinating research. You mentioned um, one of the companies is, is Form Energy. Um, are, are you uh, thinking about spinning out other companies based on, on, on the other technologies as well? Yeah, so uh, the, the model that um, uh, I've followed is that uh, we carry out research projects to answer you know, scientific and engineering questions. And uh, when uh, and I, I can tell you honestly, I've never started a research project with the intent of creating a company. Right? Uh, but what we uh, have developed over time is the pattern recognition uh, to know uh, when there's this, the right convergence of things that makes a uh, uh, makes a company worth spinning out. And it's you know it's it's a combination of of, of the kinds of things that many of you will recognize. But uh, increasingly. Uh, come to think of it as uh, whether or not there's a white space uh, of unmet need uh, that's looking for a technology to fill it. Right? And so uh, uh, it, what we have started, what we have already done is to take the cement approach and to uh, spin that out as an early stage startup. Uh, uh, Leah Ellis, who this picture you saw there, uh, is leading that effort right now. Uh, and we're in the seed stages with that effort. Uh, the the, the uh, incinerator ash effort, that's a research project. We'll see. We'll see if, you know, if uh, the right elements are there. Uh, it may be another couple of years we can come back and revisit whether or not this went anywhere. Right? Uh, but we always learn something by doing the research. Yeah. No, that, that's fascinating. Definitely going to be uh, uh, startups to, to watch and keep an eye on. I also wanted to ask you, um, you mentioned you know, you've talked about sectors of the economy that are hard to decarbonize and air transportation is one of those. Uh, what are your views on electrical aviation? Ah, so that's a, that's a very interesting question. You know, in the world of batteries today, we're seeing a, a bifurcation. Uh, and so uh, it has been centered around electric vehicles and around portable devices and certainly around lithium ion uh, battery technology. Uh, but we're clearly seeing a, a, a you know this uh, the split into technologies that are best suited for large-scale storage for the electrical system for infrastructure uh, for stationary storage, and the others towards mobility, uh, and uh, the the uh, discussion and uh, activity and you know there are a, a lot of startup companies around electric aviation now uh, has really uh, helped us focus the high energy density. Uh, battery technologies towards what we will now need, right? and so just as a, 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 to put a, a put a number out there, uh, a, a, the the high water mark in our ambition for electric vehicles today is 500 uh, watt hours per kilogram uh, for a battery, right? stored energy uh, per mass for a battery. There's a, a, a there's a program in the U.S. called Battery 500 <laughs> for exactly that reason. Uh, 500 watt hours per kilogram will get us started with electric aviation. But we really need to look at uh, the next uh, the, uh, the the next set of chemistries that can get us to you know battery 750, battery 1,000, right? and so I think that's really uh, that's really causing many uh, researchers that I know in the battery area to start uh, opening their aperture and thinking about uh, chemistries that they might not have uh, tackled before. And the, the last thing I'll say about that is that uh, you know when electric vehicles were first being developed. The discussion around the battery was all around watt hours per mass because of you know, the you know, physics of moving a, a, a vehicle down the road. Uh, but then once we start to build all those cars, uh, 
watt hours per volume became much more important because you had to have space for passengers and for uh, uh, for luggage, right? Uh, and so uh, today, you know, if you go to the automakers, watt hours per volume is more important than watt hours per mass. We learned how to manage the mass. Uh, I think what's happening with electric vehicles, we're back to watt hours per, per mass. <laughs> First, it has to fly. Then we'll worry about how much space we have. Right. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a couple of audience questions come in. Um, uh, someone is asking, they're very interested to hear your views on hydrogen as an energy storage method rather than batteries. Uh, yeah. Perhaps you can give us just a, a minute or so on that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think hydrogen, uh, let, let's just uh, maybe very briefly try to uh, summarize uh, at least my, my thoughts on you know, what are the pros and cons of hydrogen. Uh, the argument can be made that uh, all the different pieces of a hydrogen storage technology uh, already exist. You know, for instance, we know what an electrolyzer looks like. We know uh, what storage looks like. Uh, and uh, we know what a turbine that might use it, it looks like, or a fuel cell, right? Uh, so uh, I, I believe there's still a very significant integration challenge uh, there. And a lot of times, uh, you know, one doesn't really fill, uh, uh, figure out what all the engineering issues are until you try to accomplish that kind of integration. So I think, so there's a, there, I, I believe there's a significant integration challenge. There's also a co-location challenge, you know, where you have to, uh, you know, uh, things have to be located in the same place. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, you know, underground hydrogen storage, well, of course you have to be co-located with a facility, uh, with a geological feature that allows you to do that. Uh, and if it's tank storage, uh, the, the cost will be higher. I think there is still an open question as to exactly how much higher it will cost to store, for example, in steel tanks opposed to, uh, as opposed to underground. Right. But I think it's, there's definitely, uh, it, it's a, a direction that should be explored. Um, you know, uh, electrochemistry has, uh, always has a few things going for it, you know, very high you know, energy density, right? And the ability to, to, to locate, you know, really anywhere you'd like to uh, do it. As long as you're willing to, you know, uh, move the battery, you can, you, you can have storage at, 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 on that site, right? so. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Yetming, for those for the questions. Uh, apologies to any audience members if we didn't get to your questions, but just a reminder that we do have a roundtable coming up uh, a little while later on, so you, you could um, post the questions there as well, and you'll have another opportunity to ask Yetming. Thank you very much once again.